Oh hey there! This is the first episode of a new series of a series called Build a System. On Build a System, or BTS for short, I want to explore how the technologies we use as web developers work. I will explain the theory and then build a system from the ground up. I think this will be a great opportunity to also discuss software design, documentation and testing. To launch this new project, I chose to dissect the HTTP protocol. We use HTTP every day and it's kind of important in web development. Thanks! I said that HTTP was a protocol more specifically a network protocol. A protocol can be defined as a set of rules, conventions, and data structures that dictate how devices exchange data across a network. In other words, network protocols can be equated to languages that two devices must understand for seamless communication of information, regardless of their infrastructure and design disparities. It's similar to when you cross your coworker in the morning and they ask you, how are you? And you answer, fine, and you? Even though you're not fine at all. We know that HTTP is a protocol because that's what the P stands for. The other letters stands for hypertext transfer. Now we know that HTTP is a protocol that is used to transfer hypertext. The word hypertext means text beyond text or text that overcame the limitation and constraints of text. The word was first used to refer to text that could contain hyperlinks, to link documents together. Today, HTTP can be used for a lot more than text. The guy who coined the word hypertext and hyperlink also came up with the word hypermedia, but I guess HMTP didn't sound right. So yeah, the hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, is an application layer protocol for distributed, collaborative, hypermedia information systems. All right, let's jump into it. Here I have two terminal sessions open. One will be the server, and the second one will be the client. The client will make a request, and the server will respond. The first terminal will be used to listen to a TCP connection and write the response. The second terminal will be used to make a HTTP request. By the way, TCP is one of the main protocol of the internet protocol suite. Using TCP, a connection between client and server is established before the data can be sent. I might cover TCP IP further in another video, but all you need to know is that it provides a reliable, ordered, and error check delivery of a stream of bytes. To handle the server side of things, I will use Netcat which is a tool to make or listen to arbitrary TCP and UDP connections. On the server side, I will type nc-k-l8080 to listen to incoming connection to the port 8080 of my computer. On the client's terminal, I will initiate a HTTP request using the curl command. So I do curl localhost colon 8080. On the server side, you'll see our first request. Let's analyze it. The first line is usually referred to as the request line. The first part is called the method. It defines what action to perform on the resource. Get is often the default. The second part is a request URI or path. It identifies the resource that is being requested. A forward slash being the root. What the root is, is open to interpretation. Finally, the last part defines the version of the protocol that is used. For now, we'll focus on version 1.1, which is slowly being phased out in favor of version 2 or 3. But they build on top of one another. I'll cover HTTP 2 or 3 if there is some interest. By the way, don't hesitate to like, comment, and subscribe to let me know that you want to learn more about HTTP. Anyway. Every line of the message are delimited by a CRLF sequence or end of line EOL marker. CRLF stands for carriage, return, and line feed. They are usually represented by ASCII 13 and 10 or escaped R, escaped N. 
after the request line, the request may or may not come with headers. Headers can be seen as metadata on the request. They are represented by a field name and a value, separated by a colon and usually a space. In this example, the header tells us that the request was made to localhost, which can be useful to know if the server accesses a gateway or proxy. The request was sent by the curl program. The client would accept anything as a response. Finally, an empty line is sent, either ending the request or beginning the body stream. In this example, there is no body. The client is waiting for a response. So, I will type in the response, HTTP slash 1.1 space 204 space no content, then an empty line. The response starts with a status line. The first part confirmed the protocol and the version. The second part is the status code. I'm sure you know a few already, like 200 or the infamous 404. Then finally, the reason phrase. Like for the request, the status line may be followed by headers, and then it must send an empty line, a potentially a body stream. With this response, we're telling the client that the request was successfully received, understood, and accepted, but there will be no content. This completes the request, and the client terminates the connection. Let's do two more examples. On the client's terminal, I will send a new request curl localhost colon 8080 slash ping. On the server side, we can read the get request to slash ping. I will simply respond with a short message, but this time I will include some headers. So I do HTTP slash 1.1 to 100 OK. Content length is 4. Content type is plain slash text. Then an empty line and pong. The content length header will warn the client to expect 4 bytes of data. The content type headers will inform that the message is just some plain old text. Then following an empty line, you can see the message pong. This completes the request and the client terminates the connection. OK, let's do one last example. This time the client will send a body message. So I type in curl localhost colon 8080 slash users dash h to add my first header, content length, colon 23, then a second header, content type, application, slash json, and then the data with the dash d flag. Server side, we can read the request line. We have a post request to the slash users resource. The content type is application slash json, and the server should expect 23 bytes. After an empty line, we can read the JSON. The server responds with a status code of 201, which means that it created the resource. Then the server tells the client where it can find the new resource with the location header. Finally, the response states that there will be no incoming message. This completes the request, and the client terminates the connection. I think this is a good place to end this introduction to the HTTP protocol. I hope I was successful in shedding some light on the mysteries of HTTP, or at least make you curious to learn more. On the next episode, I will start implementing an HTTP server. We will learn how to decode a stream of byte into an actionable request and then respond appropriately. I will also try to offer a reliable way to test our code. On the following episode, we will prepare our server to receive and send static files to and from the file system. Then, on the next episode, we will implement data stream, which is necessary to handle larger files or upgrade to HTTP2. Finally, if all goes to plan, the fifth episode will focus on building a programmatic router, think Express Koa or Oak. At any rate, if this video was useful to you, hit the like button, leave a comment to let me know, or best of all, subscribe if you haven't yet. Okay, bye now.